Good morning, Maple Ridge Church. I'm glad that you're here to uh, be part of the online sermon at 9.30. Um, you can catch that, of course, on either Facebook or YouTube, and so you're probably watching one of those two uh, platforms. But I want to wish everybody here a happy Father's Day. And so just reminder, if you, if you forgot, uh, you know, if, if you have any way to contact your dad and, and let him know that you love him and appreciate him, uh, today is Father's Day, and so we want to wish a happy Father's Day to everybody who is, who's watching today. Um, just so you know, what's happening uh, this morning is we have the 930 service uh, here where you hear the sermon. We're going to continue in our series in Genesis. But at 1045, if you're able to just get in your car and come to the church, we're going to have an outdoor service at 1045 today. We've been doing that for a few weeks now, and we're going to continue to do that for some time. We want to take advantage of this beautiful weather that the Lord's given us. We don't have a lot of these types of days uh, in, in Minnesota, and so we want to take advantage of this great property that God has given us. And the purpose of the, um, of the, of the outdoor service is to give chance for testimonies. We're going to hear testimonies about what Jesus means to people at Maple Ridge Church. We're going to have some singing and especially fellowship because so many of us, we haven't seen each other in such a long time after coming through the stay-at-home order. So I welcome you to come to the, the, the par church parking lot for that today at 1045. Um, one other reminder before we go to prayer and our scripture reading. I would love for you to join me Monday through Friday at noon um, for a time of prayer. If you've never done it, I'd like you to try it. I'd like you to, it only takes about 10 minutes at the most. So if you have any way of set a reminder on your phone or some alarm just to let you remind yourself that you can join us at noon. And the way you can join us, it's a Zoom prayer meeting. It's a guided prayer. You don't have to pray out loud. That's not what this is about. Nobody has to even see each other. In fact, I keep all your, your cameras off. All the videos are off. Everybody's on mute. And I just lead you through a time of thinking through your relationship with Jesus that day and giving you some food, some spiritual food to go through the rest of the day following Jesus. So I'd love for you to join us at, at that. You can find that link in the Friday uh, newsletter, the Maple Ridge uh, newsletter. You can find that link. I'd love to have you join us for that. Well, as we come to our time uh, in the Word, I want to read from Psalm chapter 10. Psalm chapter 10, because Psalm 10 is the same theme as the sermon today, which is from Genesis 16. So I'd like you to listen to God's word in Psalm 10. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. He boasts about the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy and he reviles the Lord. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there's no room for God. His ways are always prosperous. Your laws are rejected by him. He sneers at all his enemies. He says to himself, nothing will ever shake me. He swears, no one will ever do me harm. His mouth is full of lies and threats. Trouble and evil are under his tongue. He lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. His eyes watch in secret for his victims. Like a lion in cover, he lies in wait. He lies in wait to catch the helpless. He catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. His victims are crushed. They collapse. They fall under his strength. And he says to himself, God will never notice. He covers his face and never sees. Arise, Lord. Lift up your hand, O God. Do not forget the helpless. Why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, he won't call me to account? But you, God, see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and you take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked man. Call the evildoer to account for his wickedness that would not otherwise be found out. The Lord is king forever and ever. 
The nations will perish from his land. But you, Lord, hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them, and you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed, so that mere earthly mortals will never again strike terror. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, after hearing that portion of your holy, inspired word, I ask that you would surprise us from what's in Genesis 16. That you would show us that you are a God who removes obstacles. Obstacles sometimes we put in our own way. Obstacles that others put in our way. You are the God who removes them. And you know that these are times of trouble, and we need you, Lord. We ask that you hear us. We ask that you encourage us. We ask that you open us. And that you fall gently on our soul as we yoke ourselves to Jesus and follow him as our Savior and Lord. For we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 16, Genesis 16, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16 today. And as we've been going through Genesis, we've seen in Genesis chapters 13 through 15, there was obstacles to the promise, to the promise for the land. And remember his nephew Lot and how Abram had to intervene to rescue because God made a promise about the land. Well, in chapter 16, it has to do with the promise of for a family. So we're moving from God's promise to Abram about the land. Now we're going to be moving to God's promise to Abram when it comes to a family. And there were obstacles to the land, and there's obstacles to the family in that promise. And Abram and Sarai are thinking that they're overcoming these obstacles, when in fact what they're doing is creating additional obstacles and more pain in their lives, and in the lives of others. Now, before we get to Genesis 16, I just have to introduce it with a couple of thoughts. First of all, this is raw and this is brutal. In fact, the English Bibles that you have almost, well, they make it more of a a rated PG sermon, but it's rated R. It is, it is, it is brutal. Um, There are things in there that are very troubling that you're going to see. And our job isn't to try to explain away what's there. That's not at all what we're going to do. Because this is the word of God that's been preserved for our faith as we follow Jesus. And so if God's not going to sanitize it and dip it in bleach, we shouldn't try to do that either. The, The things you're going to see in chapter 16 are not to be imitated. These are not things that we should be doing as followers of Jesus. Um, The behavior in this passage is to be avoided from the people that you're going to see here. But we have here an account of how God is the one who comes in troubled and wicked times where people are being oppressed, and he is the one who removes obstacles, and it's surprising the way he does it. In fact, if you're writing this down in your outline, would you write this down? Uh, God deals with the obstacles we create in surprising ways. Would you write that down? God deals with the obstacles we create in surprising ways. And that's what I want to show you today. And again, just so you understand, the book you hold in your hand, God's Word, the Bible, the Scriptures, the Torah, the, 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 word, the book that you hold in your hand, it's not meant to be a book of virtues. Oftentimes that's what happens. We, we read it or we hear it taught and it's as if we're just trying to get the moral of the story. There is no behavior to be imitated in this passage that you're going to be reading. So it's not a book of virtues. That's not what the Bible is intended to be. The Bible isn't intended to tell us, here's all the bad guys, and they wear this color clothing, and here's all the good guys, and they wear this color clothing. No, there's no good guys and bad guys. They're all bad guys. The Bible isn't a book of virtues. 
The Bible is a book of gospel, which means there's good news. And it comes against a dark cloud of evil. Things that we sometimes even create of our own choices. And the only, the good news of the Bible, the one person who's good, as you know, as a follower of Jesus, is Jesus himself. He's the point of the Bible. And so we want to follow him. So as a follower of Jesus, look at God's word. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Look at what it says. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. All right. She has an Egyptian slave named Hagar. How did she get an Egyptian slave named Hagar? Well, do you remember a few chapters back when Abram was called to the promised land and then he ran away in a famine to try to get blessed down in Egypt where there was money and prosperity? Remember that? And remember he, he gave his wife Sarah over to Pharaoh? And then Pharaoh found out about it and sent him away back to the promised land with all sorts of goods. Well, people were, people were considered a commodity back then. And so one of the things he took away from his time in Egypt when he ran away from God, he took a slave, a young girl named Hagar, who was actually Sarai's slave. She was property. And he was trying to make his life better, and he brought more pain into his life. That's what we see in verse 1. So that's where the slave comes from. It comes from the time where he ran away from God. When we run away from God, there are things that follow us for the rest of our lives sometimes. Very painful. God doesn't just push the delete button. Well, here, here's what we're seeing here. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now, I said this is messed up. This is a mess. This is really messed. But it was a common practice in that day. Uh, you would, if you couldn't have children of your own, you would, if you had the, the means, you would try to obtain another human being as a piece of property who could be a surrogate, who could basically serve as a womb for your husband to have a child that you could call your own and it could be his legal heir to get the land and all the wealth. Look at verse 3. It says, So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Again, this is not God's way. But it was the custom of the day. That's what they did back then. And it's bad. You can't justify it. And it gets worse. Look at verse 4. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. She began to despise Sarai. So the slave girl started getting a lot of positive attention. She started not feeling so much like a piece of property. She realized that she's carrying around Abram's baby. And so now probably she feels valued. She feels important. And she's carrying around her ticket out of slavery. She starts despising Abram's wife, Sarai. Look at verse 6. Look what it says. Skip to verse 6. It says, Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated. See that word mistreated? Mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. It's interesting to understand that word mistreated in the Hebrew because that's the same word that's used to what the Egyptians did to the Hebrews for over 400 years. They mistreated them. Remember the story when Moses came across an Egyptian who was mistreating a Hebrew and Moses lashed out and killed the Egyptian for mistreating the Hebrew? So this mistreated word really starts, it's like a trigger word. It, it gets, it's like a dog whistle of sorts. It, it gets the attention of the people to whom Moses is writing the book of Genesis, namely the recently released Hebrew slaves who are descendants of Abram and are on their way to the promised land to, um, to take the land and to pick up where Abram left off. 
but they were physically beaten just like Hagar was. This is a story also about domestic violence, not to be repeated. It's a story about the privilege of ownership. And oftentimes with the privilege of ownership comes the sense of entitlement that we can, because we own something, treat it poorly and do violence because we are in a position of power. And if you don't have the power and you're at the other end of the whip, running away seems like a natural thing to do. So that's what Hagar does. I mean, who wouldn't do that in their right mind? But surprise, here's what's surprising. What's surprising about this text is who God speaks to and who he doesn't speak to. In this entire chapter, there seems to be no indication that God speaks to Abram or Sarai. God only speaks to the oppressed. He only speaks to the afflicted. She's the only one, Hagar is the only one the Lord talks to in this chapter. So God deals in a surprising way with obstacles that are put in God's way, but God says, I can remove that obstacle, but you put it there. Abram and Sarah, you put it there by your own choice. Would you write this down? Here's a surprising thing. Number one, in your outline, write this down. God hears the afflicted who are treated as property. God hears the afflicted who are treated as property. Look with me at verse 9. Chapter 16, verse 9. It says, Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. Okay, we have to stop. This is what God said to Hagar. Go back to your mistress and submit to her, the one who's mistreating you, the one who's beating you, the one who treats you like property and is exploiting you. Go back to her. Now, again, we have to say this again. This is not a behavior to be imitated. And this strikes a deep chord for me because why would God tell someone to go back to a domestic violence? In fact, as I counsel, have counseled different women primarily women, who were experiencing domestic violence, my first ad piece of advice to them is to do whatever you can to leave, leave, find safety. And I have personally used my own influence to connect women who need it with resources to restart their life. I've been their advocate, legally and otherwise, and I don't want anyone to read this passage thinking that if you are a woman who's experiencing domestic violence of any kind, I don't want you to think God's asking you to go back to that abuse. Don't go back. Don't even do it for the kids. Don't do it for the kids. Your kids don't need a violent role model to imitate. And that's a pretty good message to hear on Father's Day. So this is a special situation not to be imitated. And what we're going to see here is God knows the future of what's going to happen. When she goes back, things are going to change. Apparently, the mistreatment stops. But God knows the future of this child. And God tells Hagar, I want you to go back because I have special plans for this child. Again, don't you do this, but that's what Hagar was supposed to do. Look at verse 10. Uh, the angel, the angel of the Lord is speaking. And said, the angel adds in verse 10, I will increase your descendants so much that they'll be too numerous to account. I'm going to bless you. Even though there's been obstacles in the way, I'm going to go, I'm going to bless you. I heard you. Look at verse 12. He, the Lord says about the child, he says, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility toward all his brothers. In other words, Hagar, go back there because your boy is going to grow to be a powerful leader. And guess what? The other side's going to get theirs. He is going to make their life miserable. So no one, he's going to be a wild, look at this, a wild donkey of a man. In other words, no one is going to own your boy. Your child will be free, and there will be payback for the way you've been treated. And it's surprising what God says. So we see this first person here, the, the afflicted. That's Hagar. She's treated as property. But now we're going to meet another person here. We've already talked about her, and that is Sarai. Sarai. Uh, and she's, she's the person in this story who is unable to have a child. She's barren. 
And she blames God for it. So look with me at chapter 16. Go back to verse 2. Verse 2 says, so she said to Abram, this is Sarai talking. She said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Isn't that interesting? She blames God for not having children. Lord, you failed me. Lord, you didn't keep your word. Lord, and because you didn't do this, I've been thinking about this for about 10 years since this slave has been with me from Egypt. Lord, I guess, I guess, you know, Abram and I are just going to figure out how to overcome this obstacle because, God, obviously you're not listening. God, you're not hearing us. We feel very oppressed. Our, this promise hasn't come. We feel afflicted, so we're going to have to do something. Isn't it interesting when, when we feel afflicted and we act outside of God's will, we afflict others and ourselves? But she's barren. And by the way, in that day, another thing to make note of, in that day, the custom is uh, a woman in that day defined her worth as a woman by her ability to have kids for her husband, to give him an heir, a namesake. So barrenness, barrenness could be seen in a, in a wider, instead of just infertility issues, barrenness could be seen in all sorts of ways. For example, Anything that you're not able to have, that you expected to have, that other people get easily, that could be your form of barrenness. It might have nothing to do with having children. We can all have our own form of being barren or feeling like, God, you kept this from me. It can be anything that makes us feel like we're a nobody, anything that makes us feel like a failure. And really what it is, it's worldly cultural pressure that tries to conform us into another image other than the image of God. Look with me again at chapter 16, verse 2. It says, so she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. You see, what had become a good thing, you see, the, the, the promised child was a good thing. It was a good thing. It was from God. If they just waited, it would have been a good thing. But you see, whenever we take a good thing and make it a God thing, it becomes an evil thing. It's a bad thing. That's called an idol. I-D-O-L, an idol. And our barrenness can become an idol that enslaves us. And it's a cultural pressure that Sarai felt. That baby became her God. That baby that she was promised to have became her salvation. That baby became her significance. And I just want you to, I want you to see the irony here. Isn't it ironic that, that Sarai, the slave owner, is a slave to her own barrenness? And she can't even see it. Her barrenness is enslaving her. And now she has an obstacle, but it's one that she created. And it's surprising how God deals with it. What does God do? He speaks to Hagar with what she's dealing with. She's afflicted and oppressed. But what is God, what's surprising about Sarai is, is God's response. It's very surprising. He just gives her over to it. He, he just says, okay, if that's going to become your God, I'll take my hand off and let you go your way and see what you learn. He just gives her over to it. And she can't see it. She has like blinders on, like a horse has those blinders. She has blinders on. She can't see it. And so God deals with the obstacle of barrenness that enslaves us by giving us over to it. Would you write that down in your outline? Number two in your outline, if you'd write this down, God gives us over to the barrenness that enslaves us. The barrenness that we can't even see, the, the thing that we've swallowed, hook, line, and sinker from our culture. And so sometimes God gives us over to that barrenness. So here's an application question. For you today as a follower of Jesus, what is it that tends to enslave you? What are you a slave to? How are you defining your own barrenness? What is one thing that you hate yourself for or are angry about, even at God maybe, if you don't get it? What are you enslaved to? What, what makes us feel barren? And honestly, I think all of us have to look in our heart and do some self-reflection on this because it, it's a constant battle as a follower of Jesus. We can so easily be conformed to the pattern of this world rather than being transformed 
by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12. This, this idea that there's something out there, even a good thing, that can give us salvation. Let me speak as a pastor. The things that God has been teaching me during this pandemic have been amazing. My relationship with Jesus is at a whole different place right now. I didn't realize the things that I was enslaved to as a pastor. I didn't realize the barrenness that we had. For example, the barrenness of an empty sanctuary when I come here and preach every Sunday. The barrenness of having all God's people together in one place so we can sing inside a building. Those are good things. Singing together is a good thing. Sermons are a good thing. But when you take a good thing and make it a God thing, it becomes a bad thing. And boy, has this been important for us. It's been important for me that, that no longer do I have any fear of these things at all. God, through Jesus Christ, I have been freed from that. And sometimes we don't see it for what it is because we've been looking to that good thing for salvation. And you know, one of the real ironic things about this story we're looking at here is that everybody in this story is in chains. Everybody's in chains in this story. Now, if, if you can't see what enslaves you, um, let me ask you a question to ask yourself. Because sometimes these questions, if you think about it before the Lord, these questions, if you're honest, if you're honest with yourself before God, good questions can reveal barrenness that enslaves. So here's a question. Uh, one question would be, when do you get defensive? When do you get defensive? Because there's your clue. If you become defensive, that's oftentimes your clue that there's something, your defensiveness is revealing a barrenness, something that you've made a God. You've made something God, and if you feel that your little God is threatened, then all of a sudden you, became very, you become very defensive of it. Well, what do you mean we can't sing inside of a building? What do you mean I have to wear a mask? What do you mean we have to do this? What, you see, those defense, what do you mean Black Lives Matter? Those things, if that's your reaction, then you need to bring your heart to Jesus. Because when it comes to being defensive, and believe me, because I get defensive. You know me well enough. You've seen me do it. I'm, I'm, I'm only human. But when we, look, if, if you're wrong, you have no defense. And if you're right, you don't need one. So ask yourself the question about what enslaves you, what barrenness there is, is, is where are you defensive? And if you can't see what you're enslaved to, another question to ask is, are you quick to blame others? That's a good question. This is all application from God's word, by the way. This is all application from God's word. Are you quick to blame others? Something that's your new God, something that you've created, something you're barren about, and all of a sudden, you're quick to blame others. Oh, the governor. Oh, the president. Oh, the CDC. Oh, those pastors. And it's all driven by your fear. You're blaming others. That's what Sarah, Sarah blamed other people. Look what Sarai did. Look at verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now sh that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. There it is. She's blaming. She's blaming the powerless. She's blaming her husband. She's blaming everybody but herself. And all we can say is, really? Really? Do you see yourself in this? I see myself here. I mean, this was Sarai's idea. Now, Abram went along with it. Uh, you know, he's responsible for going along. But she only has to look as far as herself to place the blame. I put my slaves in my slave in your arms. And she's angry. Oh boy. Anger, anger. That's another, that's another telltale sign that you got something barren going on inside of you. Something bad. Something bad's there. Blaming, anger, defensiveness. And she's angry and she's blaming others. 
And, and she makes it sound like she did the noble thing, like, well, I at least did the patriotic thing. I at least did the brave thing. I at least tried to solve our problem. What did you do? You did nothing. Look at, and so she blames everybody around her. I did this for you, Abram. And you and God and Hagar, this is what I get. Th that's what Sarai's saying. Everyone is guilty in her eyes except for her. And then what's just the real cherry on top of this whole thing with Sarai and her response about the barrenness that's enslaving her is then when it's convenient, she brings up God. I mean, she's never prayed in this whole chapter. She's never prayed about it. She's never talked to God. She's never saying, God, what do you want to say to me? God, I'm waiting. She doesn't do any of that, but she brings up God when it's convenient. Look what she says. Again, she, she says at the end of verse uh, 5, I believe it is, she says, may the Lord judge between you and me. She says that to her husband. May the Lord judge between you and me. She points her finger at him. Ever done that? Have you ever sinned and it blows up in your face? And then you pull out the God card? You never prayed about it up to that point, but you pull out the God card and you take, you, you take God's name in vain when it's convenient to use as a club to beat the people around you because you're blaming them because you have your own barren issues that you haven't dealt with? We got to start looking at our own hearts. That's why I mentioned last Wednesday in our devotional that when we open up our sanctuary, we come back in here, we're going to have to have a time where we just say, God, cleanse our hearts. God, we want to be the people you want us to be. When we start, we're going to gather around the communion table. We're going to worship. We're going to break bread. We're going to do communion. We're going to do it all safe, COVID standards safe and clean and everything like that. We're going to do it with all the things we need to do so that there's no fear anywhere for anybody for any reason. But we have to lay our hearts open before God. So here we have God dealing with obstacles that we create, and he does it in surprising ways. He hears the afflicted. Who are treated as property. He doesn't listen. He does, he's not doing what the privileged and the powerful want. By the way, you're going to hear me use the word privileged a lot. And it's not because I've just started using it. I've been saying that word for a long time in my sermons and in Bible studies. Privilege, privilege, privilege. Power, power, power. You're going to hear that a lot because it's all over the scriptures. And maybe now with what's happening in our culture that now you're attuned to hear that. And you might not like it, but I'm going to be relentless. I'm going to keep going after it. Because we're going to have to follow Jesus and take his yoke upon us. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Look, look back at chapter 16, verse 2. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So what's Abram here? We've talked about Hagar. We've talked about Sarai. Now we're talking about Abram here. What's, what is Abram What's Abram, what's his position? What's he doing? In verse 2 it says he agreed to what Sarah, he's just a spineless pushover. That's what Abram is. He doesn't speak up. He just goes along. By the way, polygamy is adultery. Plain and simple. And, and Abram sees how this is tearing up his family and he does nothing about it. Look at verse 6. Abram says to Sarai, he says, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. You see, there is no adult in the room. There is nobody in the room who's going to love God and love their neighbor as themselves. There's nobody there to say that. Nobody there to say, stop, this is wrong. No one would step up and stop the violence against the one who had the least amount of power and privilege. And, you know, to watch domestic violence take place against a pregnant woman and then shrug your shoulders and walk away and say, yeah, really nothing I can't do about it. No, you could do something about it. And it's really an ironic reversal when you think about this story because earlier when Abram went down to Egypt, remember how he was faithless? In Egypt, Abram was faithless. And when he was faithless, he, he gave Sarai over to the Egyptian Pharaoh. Now the roles have reversed. Now they're in the promised land. And faithless Sarai gave Abram over to her Egyptian slave. You see, this just thing is a vicious circle. Those things in the past keep coming back to bite us. Now, if we pretend there's not a problem, when there's a problem, that doesn't make the problem go away. 
we think that sometimes, don't we? Abram may have thought that too, that if I just pretend there's no problem, it'll just go away. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. What goes around comes around. And here's a surprise. Here's a surprise. Would you write this down? Here's a surprise. God allows the consequences of our passivity to follow us. That's a surprise. Maybe it's a surprise to some of us. It's not a surprise to what God's tried to teach us. God wants, to under, wants us to understand he can remove obstacles and he does it in surprising ways. He gives us, pro, we, we choose to make situations and he, lets the, he gives us over to those things and then he, lets, he, lets, he won't let it go away. Our passivity, it follows us. Now we learned earlier that Abram and Sarah had a custom of their day. If they wanted to get a legal heir, they had to impregnate a surrogate but the custom of that day, when you dig into the, the rules of that day and how that was practiced back in that day, um, it said that once a person who was a slave has that child, that slave is no longer a slave. And they're never to be thrown out of the home once they're pregnant. They're now part of a polygamous family. What that means is this is, in other words, the godless custom of Abram's day was godlier than, and it was more compassionate, and the rule of the day was more compassionate and godlier than this supposedly godly man named Abram. Abram didn't even hold up to the standards of the customs of his day. He allowed her to be thrown out of the house as a pregnant woman. And the Lord let the consequences of his passivity haunt him his entire life. His entire life he was haunted by this. Look with me at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 is when the Lord, an angel of the Lord or the Lord, speaks to, uh, is speaking to um, uh, Hagar. And look what it says in verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord, notice this, Ishmael, Ishmael, what does it mean? For the Lord has heard your, of your misery. That's what Ishmael's name means. The Lord hears. The name Ishmael means the Lord hears. The Lord hears. So if Abram had listened to God and waited for God's timing, if Sarai had listened to God and waited for God's timing, then none of the generational warfare, which still goes on today, between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac. All because Abram didn't stop and realize God Years. Every time he said Ishmael's name, every time Sarai heard Ishmael's name said, it was a haunting reminder, God hears, God hears, God hears. Do you want to know why you're in this spot? God hears, but you didn't think he did. God hears, and it's surprising. We pay a high price when we forget that God hears. So look with me at chapter 16, verse 15. Look what it says. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. And every time he heard the word Ishmael, it was a little part of him. It was probably a dagger in his heart. So we've met Hagar, we've met Sarai, and we've met Abram. There's a fourth character in this story that we need to meet. And it's the angel of the Lord. The Lord himself. Look at verse 7. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was the spring that was beside the road to Shur. Look at verse 10. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Okay, time out. Uh, some of you are looking at your footnotes of your Bible. You're saying, wait a minute, Pastor Scott didn't talk about who the angel of the Lord is. That's not important. I know we want to make that important, but that if you if you if you get if you go down that rabbit hole and it's a deep rabbit hole, you're going to miss what the point of the story is. God spoke, whether it was literally, whether it was a pre-incarnate form of Christ, whether it was an angel of the Lord, whether it was the Lord Himself, doesn't matter. God spoke, and it was through an angel. And when He spoke, notice how 
how Hagar reacted. Notice how God spoke to the oppressed. Notice the way God talked to those who had no power or privilege. You see, last week we saw Abram cut a deal with God, or God cut the deal, remember the part, and a dread came over Abram, remember that? A sense of dread. God spoke and it was dreadful. In Moses' day, when God was giving the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, God spoke and the people had to cover their ears because they thought they were going to die when God spoke. And later on, the prophet Isaiah, when he saw the Lord in the temple, he had a nervous breakdown. He, he actually lost it when God spoke. And this is what's so interesting about God speaking to the oppressed, to Hagar. Look with me at verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. When God speaks to the oppressed, to a woman who's running for her life to save her and her life of her baby, there's no thunder, there's no lightning, there's no dread, there's no fear. She didn't think she was going to die. She didn't have a nervous breakdown. You see, when God comes close with mercy and compassion, he does it to the brokenhearted, to those who are oppressed and afflicted. He doesn't do that when he speaks to the powerful and the powerless. When he speaks to the powerful and the privileged, he speaks very differently to them. But when he speaks to this woman who's on the run, he comes to her in gentleness. She's not in fear. In fact, she even gives God a name. You saw me. You saw me. You saw me. You see me. You know what I'm going through. Would you write this down in your outline? Number four, God seeks out the oppressed and the brokenhearted. God seeks out the oppressed and the brokenhearted. So the Lord says to this woman who's on the run, Hagar, he says, where are you going? What's wrong? You know, centuries later, an angel came to another young girl in a little village and said, you're going to have a son. And I'm going to tell you about your son's future. His own people are going to reject him. And he's going to feel abandoned. And he's even going to feel his father's face turn away on a cross. He's going to die and bear the afflictions and the sins of the world. And he's our Savior. So God hears the cry of the oppressed and the brokenhearted because Jesus came to seek and save the lost, the poor in spirit. So Jesus is inviting Hagar, who's worn out and weary. Jesus invites her. Anybody who's a Hagar today, Jesus is inviting you to follow him because he'll give you rest. He sees what you're going through. He knows what you're dealing with. He hears you. And God also is inviting the Sarais who have been listening to this message. If you're a Sarai, if there's some barrenness inside of your own soul, if there's something that's a good thing that you've turned into a God thing, that you've turned into an idol, God is saying, I'm inviting you, Sarai. I'm inviting you. I'm also inviting you to come and worship me in a new way. To find your value and significance in your relationship with me. And some of us are Abrams who are haunted by our past. And we need to turn from our passivity and follow Jesus, who's the resurrection and the life. Because Jesus Christ is the God who removes obstacles in such surprising ways to anyone who will follow him as Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we ask that you have mercy on us. God, we ask that you would surprise us again. We love you. Help us love you more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.